to sit down for this because I like motorcycles. I just don't believe in gravity sometimes. Um, wow. Um, so despite the name, uh, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from here originally. Um, does any, can anyone guess where my accent's from? And there's a reason I do this because language and accents are very important within a class content. So there we go. Excellent. Um, so my name's Ailish, or you can call me Pidge, or you can call me Beth. Either uh, any of the three uh, work. So a little bit about me. Hold on here. Why is this? All right, there we go. Is this supposed to be audio no, it's not. <laughs> So a little bit about me, um, in case you don't recognize where my accent's from. I'm originally from New Jersey, although I live in Dublin. Um, and if you have been out in the East Coast, you recognize that my accent is uh, kind of working class New Jersey. Um, I was raised a working class kid. Uh, my father was a truck driver. My mother was a secretary. Um, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. and. One of the things that I realized as a working class kid and as a trans woman is that in order for me, especially in the United States, to uh, be able to afford the medical stuff that I needed to do, I needed to be able to make money. And one of the ways that I figured out very young to do this was through technology. Now, technology has barriers to entry, but Traditionally, there's been kind of these little routes around them. So back when I, 25 years ago, when I first got into tech, it was you found yourself a desktop support technician job, and then maybe you worked yourself into QA, and then maybe you worked yourself into engineering or networking or something like that. And nowadays, it's you go get a GitHub account, maybe contribute some code to open source projects, um, but it's still difficult. Um, Folks over here talk about class a lot more than Americans do. Um, and there's a story I want to tell about why I don't eat pasta. Um, and, and, and as a working class person who has worked in technology for the past two decades, it's this thing that I realized very early on is my lunchtime conversations with my coworkers were things that I had to self-police. I had to self-police language. I had to self-police background. Um, I couldn't tell the story of the uncle of mine who drowned in a movie theater because he was drunk, um, because everyone would look at me weird. Um, so these were folks that, that did not have the same background as I did. So one of the reasons I don't eat pasta is because I ate it for two years straight from age about five to seven. Um, my father was a team uh, or a uh, teamster. He was shop steward for his trucking company and they went out on strike. Now, if you come from a uh, uh, trade union background or if your parents came from a trade union background, you know that strike pay is crap pay. So my father would wake up early in the morning, go to the picket line, and then sometime in the afternoon, leave the picket line and go to his second job, which was delivering pasta for a pasta company in North Jersey. Um, he wasn't a very good delivery guy because a lot of those boxes seemed to have fallen off the truck. <laughs> so that was what we ate for two years. Um, and I tell this story because for a lot of people in tech, it's a very middle class thing or upper middle class thing. Um, but tech has been really good to me a lot of the time. Um, it has allowed me to uh, do things that I needed to do. It has allowed me to support my family. Um, and honestly, like a lot of people ask me, what do you do? I'm an overpaid auto mechanic. People, don't, people in tech don't like hearing that for obvious reasons, but that is what I do. I'm an embedded developer. I'm an overpaid auto mechanic. That's what I do. I fix things. Um, so tech has a lot, opened up a lot of opportunities for me and done a lot of good, especially when it comes to finance. But it's only been good to me sometimes. Um, if you were a working class person, and uh, I'll tell a s story about um, a company that I started at. And I, I, I first day in, we were all sitting around the table. and. Um, they're going around and what you had to do is say what your job was and 
uh, where'd you graduate from college and what degree you had and got around to me and I went, you know, I graduated from Northeast and this is what I'm doing. And the gentleman next to me said, don't you mean Northeastern? And I'm like, no, Northeast High School. And he looked at me and he said, well, you did rather well for yourself in that kind of smarmy way that people who uh, have PhDs and blah, blah, blah from MIT do sometimes. Um, and I looked at him like, yes, I don't have 100,000 worth of student loan debt. <laughs> now, there's something that I've been thinking over the past 10 years is that, well, tech's been really good for me. How is it done for people that I grew up with? How has it been for people in my family? And it's not been so great sometimes. Um, and I use this picture specifically because this was a job my mother did. Uh, she was a telephone operator back in the 60s. Um, does anyone here know anyone who's a telephone operator anymore? Yeah, no, that, that job's been replaced. Um, and when I was doing the slide deck, I looked at that and I'm like, well, let me look at some of the things that I've done. And a lot of the jobs that I have done, so for example, cashier, that's going away. That job is going away and it's being replaced by technology. Um, I was a dishwasher. Um, that job, I, like I was surprised actually that someone figured out how to do automated dishwashing to the point where it takes it off the trays, it scrapes all the food out, it, reset, it washes everything and restacks it. But that job's going away. Um, when was the last time you talked to an actual teller at a bank? Those jobs are going away. So this is what is known as technological unemployment. And it's actually not a new concept. Um, this is one of the ways capitalism works. Capitalism, that, you know, we, we hear this all the time from CEOs. CEOs say, well, you know, in order to maximize profits, I have to reduce costs. In order to do, reduce costs, I have to do efficiencies. And the efficiencies are all born on the backs of working class people. And then I saw this. This happened uh, earlier this year. Um, a team of trucks drove across Europe into the port of Rotterdam, and no one was driving them. And then I thought to my father, who was a truck driver, and went on strike for two years. Um, and the fact that now we're looking at truckers being gone. Um, we've seen this, that whenever I hear the term disruptive technology, I think, and you will excuse my language, bullshit. This is something that is going after my family. This is something that's going after my class. Um, we see this with Uber. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason taxi cab drivers are not happy with Uber. Um, there is a reason why truck drivers are not happy with this. Make no mistake, self-driving cars are not there for you know people to sit in their Tesla and say, I want to go here, take me here. They are here to replace working class jobs. And this is as old as capitalism itself. So I hear, oh my god, you're a Luddite. And I'm like, well, yeah, but not the way you're thinking about it. When we talk about Luddites, people assume you're anti-technology. No, I'm a technologist. I, I do this for a living. My company does this for a living. What I am is also someone who's very aware of where I came from and my class and my class solidarity. So when we talk about the Luddites, well, people just assume, oh, they didn't like technology, and that's not true. Uh, the Luddites occurred in the 18th and uh, early 19th centuries, and they were a response to uh, the introduction of automated looms. And it wasn't so much that they were, oh my god, these are you know, the devil's instruments. It was, these are putting us out of work, and we're starving. And it got to the point, actually, where at one point, the uh, British government had more soldiers fighting Luddites than they did Napoleon in the I Iberian Peninsula. <laughs> Never make a mistake. The state will always protect capital. Um, to the point where, in 1813, um, they created a law called the Frame Breaking Act, which made it a capital offense to destroy uh, any of these technologies, uh, the automated loom, the, the uh, stocking weaving uh, uh, frame. Um, and 60 to 70 Luddites ended up hit being hung for this. So when, we talk about, when I talk about this, I get accused of class warfare. 
And that's not true. It's only class warfare if the other side can fight back. Um, what we look at is class massacre. Um, we look at working class people being put out of jobs because uh, capitalism defines that, oh, we need to do efficiencies. We need to make things more lean, more efficient. And it is always born on the backs of working class people. So if it's only class warfare, if the other side fights back, let's fight back. Let's replace the CEO. So um, we've already decided that corporations are people, at least in the United States with Citizens United, corporations have the right to free speech, ergo they're people. Then can we embody that? Can we actually create something that's basically an automated CEO? Well, you know, the thing is, is that corporations are machines and CEOs actually do things. Well, I'm a CEO, I own my own company, and to tell you the truth, I have no idea what I do. So I need to go look this up. <laughs> what do CEOs actually do? Well, we decide corporate business strategy, which is basically data-driven decision-making. We shape corporate culture, which is basically, we, we kind of hold people's hands and make, make the corporate culture nice so that people want to come work with us. Uh, we make day-to-day -day decisions. Well, that's data-driven decision-making as well. Um, and we're responsible for the overall financial picture. Well, yeah, that's something that machines do as well, too. We have automated trading machines. So why can't we actually replace the CEO? If we're replacing cashiers and we're replacing truck drivers and we're replacing dishwashers, really, what do CEOs do that need to be human? Well, maybe CEOs should be machines um, because we hear this, well, data-driven decision-making. Well, you know, um, I've known a few CEOs in my time and I know a few upper managers in my time. And whenever they say data-driven decision-making, I go, okay, you're going to cherry pick the data, put your own biases attached to it to get to the decision that you want because none of this actually has anything to do with data-driven de decision-making. So, okay, then can we at least standardize the biases by working you out of the picture? Because, you know, we can sit there and say, oh, you know, well, we can get rid of all biases by having a computer do it, and, you know, programmers are people too, and we have our own biases, but at least we can standardize them and then work them out. So, when... I say this, people go, well, why can't they be? Well, there's a reason why they can't be. Um, and it's actually, unfortunately, not a good one. Um, but the thing is, is that this is already happening. So if you've heard of IBM Watson, I played it once at a, at a uh, tech conference, uh, a game of Jeopardy against it. I lost miserably. Um, I think slaughtered me, it was awful. Um, but IBM has created a intelligent lawyer called Ross. And what Ross does is Ross goes and does legal research. So Ross is taking the job of a paralegal. So that, and, and the reason behind this is fascinating is because legal, legal uh, uh, lawyers were upset that they could not bill their 400 euros an hour to do legal research. So they had to eat that cost. So instead of saying, well, you know what? I don't need to make 250,000 euros a year. I can do with 150 and actually hire a legal researcher. They've decided that they're gonna outsource a lot of their legal work to Watson and it will go and do its legal research for it. So, this actually makes sense if you're looking at it from an entire capitalist standpoint. You know, we need to, this is how this works. We're going to, and I'm not saying I necessarily agree with it, but we're going to reduce that cost by either uh, socializing those costs, um, creating people who are unemployed, um, and privatizing profits. Um, so what does this actually look like in real life? So a trucker, and these are US dollars because this is what I could find. Um, the average operating cost for a lorry um, that works in a year is about 180,000 uh, US. 
uh, the number one expense is fuel, the second expense is the driver. Works out to about 26% of the operating cost. So there is a company that makes uh, a self-driving uh, kit that attaches to trucks made after 2013, and this costs around 30,000. So within a year, you know, I've essentially made that back. Now the problem with this is that there are legal issues. Now if uh, you saw the introduction of Uber to certain cities, uh, you saw that the taxi drivers were not very happy and they protested. Um, in the States, there are 13.6 million truckers um, trying to get laws passed to allow automated trucking is going to be very difficult. Uh, I think one state in the uh, United States has it and nowhere in Europe has it yet. Um, but, you know, if you're a corporation, the return on, on this investment is very profitable. After a year, um, assuming that nothing has gone wrong, because we know that technology never fails, um, you know, this is going to be very profitable and you will uh, get back that money in a year and just all the truckers will be unemployed. Well, that's great. But from a return on investment, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If you go after a CEO though, CEOs make a lot of money. And if we can actually replace a CEO and do it very inexpensively or relatively inexpensively, you know, we can recognize those cost benefits uh, and we can recognize them rather rapidly. So, you know, let's assume 100 million over five years it takes to develop a CEO. And this is kind of a guesstimate just based on how much I know it took them to develop Watson and to develop something on top of that. You know, all I need to do is replace two CEOs. That's all I need to do. I need to replace two CEOs. If I can sell this for 40 million a pop to two companies, I've made back my investment. Uh, now, yes, there are legal issues. And the legal issues are actually very important because why do CEOs need to be human? Well, there's one reason that CEOs, CTOs, people on the boards of directors need to be human. And I love this next picture. So why, why CEOs can't be machines? This is why, I love this picture. <laughs> I look at this picture and I laugh. I laugh because if you go into Google image search and you type CEO arrested, this guy's face comes up and I love this. Um, does anyone know who this is? Yeah, he, he's this fucking dirt ball. That, <laughs> sorry, I'm working class. We use the word fuck as an adjective gerund, it's, it's wonderful. This is a slime bag CEO that went and uh, uh, up the price of a pill to 750 uh, bucks. But he's not getting arrested for that. He's getting arrested for SEC violations. We as a society deci have decided that we're not really gonna arrest CEOs. We're not gonna send them to jail. It happens very infrequently. It happened here like, what was it, two weeks ago, three bankers got sent to jail. I mean, it was like only two to three years, but I was kind of like, I'm not a carceral feminist, but... <laughs> I will make an exception. Um, so we have a society have decided that we're not going to punish wealthy people when they do bad. But instead of saying, well, if we're not gonna punish them, let's just not punish them, let's not make them machines, that's the wrong answer. Um, I'm not saying anyone should do the, the, the robotic CEO. If you do it, I will be horrified. Um, and if you do it, I, I, I want some money from that. <laughs> Because I am immediately going to take that money and, and spend it on things to fight you. Um, um, so the question I pose is what changes can we as technologists make in what we do so that the issues around technological employment are on eliminated or reduced? Um, I got in trouble at a boff Oh, geez, this would have been six years ago, seven years ago, um, at OSCON, was it? OSCON, yes. And we were, I, I, I don't even remember the name of the boss, but we were talking about kind of social responsibility within technology. And I said something like, we need to actually start thinking about what we do. 
we need to say, no, I'm not going to do that. We need to actually refuse. Um, we need to say, yeah, no, that's kind of a really disgusting thing to want to do. I'm not going to work on that. And yeah, that limits you in what you can do, but there's a lot of things out there that you can do. And the response was by the person running the BOF, we've already grabbed the tiger by the tail, we need to hold on. And I thought that was really, really silly. <laughs> if I've got my hand on the tiger's tail and the tiger's running around, I, I wanna let go and run away because I don't want that thing biting me. Um, so my challenge is think about what you do. Think about how this affects working class people, how it affects people of color, how it affects trans people, how it affects the entire world. Because we can sit there and pat ourselves on the shoulders for disruptive technology, but if we're not making the world a better place, enriching everyone, then we're not doing our jobs. So. Um, if you need to talk to me, there's my Twitter and my email, and I'm not giving you all my Facebook because I don't know you. <laughs> so, that's it.